So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Associate Professor Daniel Novakovic, who's an Australian ear, nose and throat surgeon with international subspecialty training in laryngology and care of the professional voice. He's co-director of the Dr. Liang Voice Program at the University of Sydney and currently acts as Vice President of the Laryngology Society of Australasia. He runs a clinical laryngology practice in Sydney, Australia and has multiple active research interests in the field. Are we good to go? Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Kate, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to everyone for joining us here tonight. Um, we, we had a slight delay in the webinar two weeks ago, um, but um, uh, of where I was had to take some time off, but we're back in full action now and um, looking forward to uh, presenting tonight and sharing with you a little bit about um, what we've been experiencing uh, to help you understand what's going on in our field and hopefully um, uh, get a bit of your experience uh, and, and maybe give you some insights and um, some advice uh, helping you navigate this difficult time uh, for people living with the voice disorder. So since March, uh, this has been my world. It's been uh, completely turned upside down. Um, we, we were sort of tracking along well. We've all had a very difficult time in Australia with the bushfires last year and then the then the uh, then the drought, uh, and then then this thing hit in February March, uh, and, and it's really tipped everything upside down for us clinicians uh, as well as for for the general public. Um, so COVID nineteen hit us, and and then we've learnt a few things uh, over the past uh, few months. Uh, we've learnt that about eighty percent of people will have a, a mild to moderate flu like illness and recover. Um, especially younger people, and initially we thought, "Wow, this is this is great. Um, you know, it'll it'll come in and it'll it'll leave. Everyone will get it." But then we started to understand that there were higher risk groups, and and that included people over seventy, people with comorbidities, so breathing problems, lung problems, uh, blood pressure issues, people who are um, heavier. And males seem to be affected more with respect to. Um, uh, the risk of uh, a serious morbidity, uh, pregnant people, and possibly even cigarette smokers. Um, and, and the next thing we learnt um, is that this wasn't just a normal virus, uh, that it was extremely infectious. And not only was it transmissible via droplets, which is coughing and um, uh, coughing on people and sneezing and blowing your nose, but also via aerosol transmission. And the aerosol transmission particularly uh, gets very scary uh, for, for us as clinicians because a lot of what we do uh, involves creating aerosols, especially as ENT surgeons. We've learned that the virus can survive for up to a few days on certain surfaces. And we've learned that uh, there is a silent carrier period of, of somewhere between two and 10 days. Um, some people uh, continue to be silent carriers um, without ever exhibiting any symptoms. Um, it got sort of scary when we started to learn that loss of taste and smell might be the only sign. Um, thankfully, most uh, cases uh, we've seen recovery of taste and smell. Um, and what really scared us uh, back then in February and March is the potential uh, for this uh, condition, as we've seen elsewhere in the world, to overwhelm our health system. And we really weren't ready at that stage. Um, with ENT, uh, we started to get scared when we when we started receiving reports from our colleagues in the UK uh, and in Iran of serious illness and even death in in some uh, not just older people but young ENT surgeons uh, from doing routine clinical visits. So they'd see a patient in the clinic who you know may have been symptomatic or not, who'd um, you know maybe cough in their face, and um, we think that when, we, when there's a high viral load, um, we get a more severe infection and the highest viral load is in the lungs and the throat. Um, and that's where we work as ENT surgeons. And, and we started hearing reports that uh, procedures that generate aerosols, as I spoke before, um, may be high risk. 
Uh, and the problem is that a lot of our procedures, especially looking at someone's voice box with an endoscope, and I'm sure that all, all of the dysphonia patients out there at some stage have unfortunately um, had to have an exam where we pass a little camera through your nose. That's called a, an endoscopy or a laryngoscopy. Um, so that's an aerosol generating procedure. Uh, any sort of cough testing, respiratory function testing, uh, tracheostomy care, basically any operation in the mouth, nose or throat uh, can be considered an aerosol generating procedure. And, and we became very, very scared at that stage. And a lot of this information came around late March and a lot of ANT surgeons on March 23rd, um, because of the reports that we had, suddenly just stopped seeing patients and operating. Uh, we, we were scared. We didn't know what to expect. Um, the timeline that followed is that all elective surgery was 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 suspended on March 25th by the government, um, and we went into contingency planning and protocol development. So we weren't sitting at home twiddling our thumbs. We've been working with the hospitals. Um, we were told to avoid face-to-face -face contact with patients because we didn't know the extent of this disease, who was positive, who was negative, how prevalent it was. We were advised to use um, PPE, which is personal protective equipment for all ENT exams. The problem we had is, number one, uh, it wasn't available. You could not get your hand on a surgical mask. Number two, we didn't know what type of equipment we should be using, and we still don't have good evidence regarding that. And number three, uh, which we found out recently, is there's been fake stuff coming into the country. So uh, some of the masks we might have bought uh, may not be doing anything at all to protect us as, and, and yourselves as patients and us as doctors. And, and the outcome of that is that appointments were cancelled, patient numbers dropped, and, and there was really limited access to ENT services. Uh, thankfully, within a week or so, um, we had the introduction of telehealth item numbers. Um, and every day, uh, since that day, we've been getting daily updates from every angle. I must get about 40 new emails a day about COVID, about guidelines from hospitals, from the government, from colleagues, from international groups. And the problem is that the, the information is rapidly changing and is often inconsistent. Um, so we have, to, we have to sort of work through that information and look for a reliable source. Um, thankfully, um, then elective surgery did restart after a few weeks um, at 25% in April, and this was for urgent cases only. Um, in late May, that's increased to 50%, and the plan is that we go back to about 75% of surgery, uh, elective surgery by the end of June. Um, it's only in only in May that the College of Surgeons released proper guidelines regarding personal protective equipment. So we were kind of flying blind there for a period of about six weeks. So what were the initial recommendations? We were, it was recommended that we delay elective ANT surgery and do urgent cases only. It was recommended that we triage patients to decide who needs urgent care. It was recommended that we reduce risk by minimising face-to-face patient contact by screening all patients prior to seeing them, minimising the number of people in our waiting or consult room and, and not doing aerosol generating procedures and, and to protect ourselves with appropriate PPE. Uh, so these were the initial recommendations. So how do we manage when we're thrown in the deep end and there's been a change of rules, there's been a change in mentality uh, of doctors, patients and just general community expectation uh, we've had to implement changes in practice and we've had to change the way we deliver healthcare all very rapidly with minimal uh, evidence and guidance. Uh, and, and it's been tough uh, adapting. But we, we have seen a significant impact upon ENT services as a result. Um, a lot of practices closed and just said, look, we're not accepting patients anymore. Um, we don't know what's happening. A lot of people, I understand, who, who were sort of on the borderline of retiring um, and were, may have been at risk of age, um, have decided to bow out. Um, we were told that endoscopic examinations were considered high risk, which is a problem when you're trying to diagnose uh, a voice disorder. Uh, we were told there's no surgery to happen, but our emergency department services continued. So how did we adapt at our practice? Well, um, we have made a very, very rapid transition to telehealth. Um, and the benefit of that 
is that we're able to gather information before uh, seeing someone uh, prior to the consultation. So we're getting a detailed referral uh, to be able to triage the urgency of the consultation. And our staff now will ask patients about symptoms and we're relying more heavily on patient reported outcome measures. So these are those forms that annoyingly you get to fill in every time you're sitting in our waiting room that ask you about your voice, you swallow, uh, the irritation in your throat, how you're breathing, how your singing is. Uh, we use all this information to make uh, an assessment and to triage people, this was early on. Uh, and then we would also gather information during our telehealth consultation. Uh, so by um, seeing someone online, uh, preferably with a video, we can get a reasonable history, we can do a basic perceptual voice evaluation and a very, very basic physical examination. And that, that's really what we started doing uh, towards the beginning of April. Um, so that the process uh, for laryngeal problems, so problems with the voice box, uh, when we're doing a telehealth consultation, we take all of this information and we formulate a likely diagnosis. And we can categorise diagnoses um, based upon, uh, we've got a fairly good system, and I think uh, Chris Payton will speak to this a little, for, little further, um, for characterising what we think is happening based upon the history and assessment. Um, is this an organic lesion? Is there something there that's on the vocal fold that, that, um, that is affecting the voice? And if it is, is it likely to be high risk, for example, in a smoker or an elderly person, or is it a low risk lesion? Is this a functional problem? So not a problem with, with, um, with uh, the structure, but rather the problem with how we control the voice box, or is it a combination of both? Once we have a rough idea of that, then we can triage the need for actually having a look at the vocal cords with the laryngoscopy. And, and we've developed a system where it's either category one, so if we think it's likely that it's something um, that could be nasty, it'll be a category one assessment. A category two, if, if it's something that look needs fairly urgent assessment, uh, but it's not super urgent, uh, category three is sort of um, less impact and less likely to be something nasty. And then by seeing someone via telehealth and, and triaging them, we can often begin treatment remotely. if. For example, someone has significant nasal symptoms or reflux symptoms, we're able to initiate treatment uh, remotely and we can um, maybe if there was a wait to see someone for, for formal scoping, we could refer them to a speech pathologist if we thought that um, there wasn't a high risk of this being an organic lesion or that they may respond to some speech therapy. Um, so that's, that's how we've changed. The challenges to this is that there is new information coming in daily. Um, we've had to train our staff in new systems. Um, patients initially were not very happy being told that they could not come in for an appointment. Uh, and, 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 and even now it's very, very difficult for our staff to explain why uh, we've got this need for telehealth um, to reduce face-to-face -face contact um, and, and just a system we've implemented. Um, data collection systems have been challenging. It's difficult to collect online questionnaires. Um, it's much easier when someone's sitting in your waiting room to fill out pieces of paper. Um, billing in Medicare has been a challenge uh, and there's been technical challenges with internet dropping out, with video conferencing. And of course, we've had to preserve uh, our personal protective equipment. And even now, um, we're running out of gowns and we don't, we don't have access to, to a place to buy more protective gowns, so, which is what we need to scope people. So we've got limited resources and we're making do with that. Um, the good news, though, as everyone's aware, is that the curve has been flattened. It's been squashed in Australia. And most of our new cases are, are now coming in from overseas. Um, and the risk now of an asymptomatic community infection, that means the risk that uh, a person who walks into my office who doesn't have any symptoms um, of COVID, who doesn't have upper respiratory infection, or who does not have a, a cough or a fever, is about one in 100,000. So it's extremely, extremely low at the moment. Um, and the other thing that we've learned is that um, although aerosol procedures uh, can transmit virus, there's much less virus in aerosolised um, 
uh, procedures than there is by someone coughing on you. Uh, and PPE has been a little bit become a little bit more available, although um, as we said, there's there's fake stuff out there that concerns us. And this is the curve, and you can see that. Um, uh, really, really Australia's done remarkably well uh, compared to some of the other countries. Uh, and and I, I, I just feel that everything we've done so far has really helped us bring things under control. Um, and, and I think now from a hospital point of view, we're ready to deal with uh, any sort of second onslaught uh, that may occur and that li is likely to occur. Uh, and this, this looks at the new cases. Um, I don't have the, the latest data from the last few days. I, rec I understand that's gone up a little bit and we expect to see another sort of increase in the next few weeks. But hopefully um, things will remain under control if our borders are controlled and we can trace people. Uh, so moving forward, uh, there has been a gradual resumption of ENT services. Um, both in the clinic and surgically based on priority. Um, from our point of view, it's not unusual to expect that your consultation may be separate from the examination process. Um, and we have increased safety precautions and increased um, protective equipment. And I'll talk a little bit more to that uh, in, in another section. Um, so how are patients with dysphonia managing during the COVID crisis? Um, we've had feedback from patients with voice disorders that they're, they're really struggling um, during this point in time and, and they're struggling because, you know, they can't um, necessarily use the phone as easily as normal. Um, the main concern that people are having is that um, people think they're sick and are avoiding them. And this is a little bit of a universal concern, not just with voice patients, but with a lot of our patients who have chronic breathing problems and problems with chronic cough and throat irritation. Um, you know, questions about should we be wearing a mask? Um, does a mask, uh, you know, may, may make it more difficult to be understood? Um, is that necessary to wear a mask? Um, is it safe to come to the doctor for usual treatment? Um, I would say that yes, it is at the moment. Um, we're in a good position um, and uh, your doctor um, hopefully has implemented uh, the similar safety precautions that most of us have now. Um, aren't the doctors too busy? We're here, we're available. Um, the expected onslaught we were, we were, we, we expected in the public hospital system has not eventuated so far. Um, so we're not too busy to see people um, with uh, voice problems and breathing problems. Um, what services are available right now? Um, I think that you'll find that there is an increased availability of access to ENT surgeons. And I think um, that um, certainly uh, things are freeing up and I think that you are able to, to, to book in and see people. Um, telehealth, we found, has been working for voice problems for the initial assessment and triage process. Um, I do prefer to see someone on the screen. Um, it's very difficult to do a telehealth conversation for a voice problem for a dysphonic patient without seeing them. I think we get a lot of value in a visual um, interaction as well. So there is great value in that uh, rather than being on the telephone. But as, as explained before, we can glean a lot of information and make assessments uh, based upon what, what the information we gather prior to and during the consultation. And how do we support people with chronic dysphonia? And this is not just a COVID issue, it's an ongoing issue um, where truly the Australian Dysphonia Network uh, comes into play. Um, we, we acknowledge that COVID-19 has had a significant impact, especially on patients with chronic dysphonia, um, both in the external perception and judgment by other people in the community. Uh, we understand that you are experiencing greater communication challenges. And we understand that there has been limited access to ENT and speech pathology services, both for diagnostic and therapeutic um, uh, reasons. Um, but also there seems to have been a change in vocal demand. So on the, on the plus side, a lot of our patients who have had high vocal demands, for example, school teachers, um, have at least had a little bit of a break 
um, from conditions that may have put their voice under stress. And we see this in gym instructors, school teachers, um, uh, any professional voice users. Um, during the social isolation, vocal demands might have decreased. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, we're, we're all facing different struggles uh, financially and, and obviously uh, with respect to the social isolation. And one of the major problems is that there's limited information available and this information is based upon limited evidence. We just haven't had the evidence to, 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 to sort of understand what to do, uh, but that continues to develop. And there's certainly some research we're doing at the moment, uh, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on health services in Australia for voice people. So what's my advice for patients? Uh, we, we understand times are challenging. Uh, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, draw upon your resources, draw upon patient support groups, um, understanding family and friends. Uh, there's always a friendly ENT surgeon available or a speech pathologist somewhere there um, who can help and, um, and help address any questions. And um, we're always available via telehealth um, uh, if necessary. So the next section I wanted to speak to is, is how do we remotely manage patients with laryngeal problems during COVID-19. And, and as mentioned before, it's not only voice that's affected um, by laryngeal problems, but uh, it can also affect uh, the functions of breathing, swallowing and sensation in the throat. And all of these functions are normally taken for granted. And when they're disrupted, we understand that they can have a significant impact upon quality of life. Uh, as we already said, uh, our initial telehealth assessment is designed to minimise face-to-face -face contact, collect all the relevant information, make a likely diagnosis and assess the urgency. And in the meantime, we, we start to assess what other tests can we do? Can we start treatment in the meantime, such as speech therapy or medical therapy? Um, I've already spoken about tools, uh, patient reported outcome measures for subjectively measuring uh, how your voice is going. Um, endoscopic, endoscopic examination, so laryngoscopy. Uh, we're doing that once again. We've restarted that with the appropriate gear. Um, sometimes we use imaging in lieu of um, other measures uh, such as CT scans um, and of course acoustic analysis. And I think Kate can probably talk a little to that about what we're doing in terms of voice recordings and analysis. But they're all, all ways we can assess um, the laryngeal problems. Um, so for our existing patients, what we want to know is, are your symptoms stable? How are they functioning with their current vocal load? Um, if they're airway patients, is their breathing stable, safe or deteriorating? And do we really need them to come in for a laryngoscopy um, at this time? And generally, if someone's tracking well uh, and doing well in terms of their patient reported outcome measures and their coping, uh, generally we'll say, look, we don't really need to see you urgently at this stage, let's, let's postpone the examination for a little while, or you might say, look, things aren't going so well, you might need to come in a little sooner. Um, I, I won't talk too much about airway symptoms, but we, we can, you know, we, we ask about breathing problems and that's been uh, the most challenging because people who need breathing procedures done on their voice box or on their windpipe have really had limited access to that. Um, but we can certainly track uh, voice symptoms uh, by using, for example, percentage normal function scales in any of my patients that have um, had treatment for um, uh, of injections into the voice box for muscle relaxation, know that they have to do homework and there are different tools available to track the voice either. We can do that daily or weekly. Um, but often I find that the patient symptoms are more important uh, than what we see on the endoscopy when we're tracking uh, patients we already know. So the, how you're feeling and what you're reporting is really more important than what I'm seeing with my camera. Um, so once again, uh, how have we been, how, what, how have things changed? Uh, we're screening all patients um, before we see them uh, with questionnaires uh, in the office where Initially, we were avoiding anaesthetic sprays, wearing appropriate equipment, um, sort of avoiding invasive procedures um, such as office-based steroid injections. Um, in the OR, once again, 
figuring out what sort of equipment we need to protect ourselves, modifying the surgical techniques that we normally use, things have had to change to minimise risk, um, avoiding things like laser procedures, which can be at higher risk um, of generating um, aerosols uh, and, and things like jet ventilation, which is an anaesthetic technique. So we've really had to change what we do on a practical basis. Uh, this is our office at the moment. Um, and the, the aims of the changes in the office are to reduce the risk to both the patients and the healthcare workers. You'll see little arrows for where people have to stand. Um, there's hand sanitizer available. We, we check your temperature on arrival. Um, we like to have no more than two, or th two patients in the waiting room. So we've separated the consult and exam rooms, um, once again, to minimise risk with their specific procedure times and procedure days for exams. Uh, and we're doing a, a, a fairly comprehensive room clean in between every patient's uh, with um, you know appropriate um, cleaning agents, which once again weren't available four weeks ago. Um, we've got special scope cleaning techniques for coronavirus, and and we've started to use extractor fans in a negative pressure room to reduce the risk of transmission between patients and between healthcare worker and patient. Um, and and this is changing over time. Um, you know, what sort of personal protective equipment do we use and who uses it? Uh, do we give it to admin staff? Do we give patients masks? Do we give healthcare workers masks? Um, this is our nurse, uh, Kate. She's donned in full gear with a respirator. Um, and the problem is that there've been limited uh, availability of uh, guidelines. Um, we've just started to get some governing body and institutional guidelines and, and they vary between hospitals and between places. And there's lots of considerations, you know, what sort of masks should we use? Normal ones, uh, N95 masks, should we, should we be using respirators? If we use masks, there's no point using them if they don't fit properly or if they're fake masks. Um, and not only do you use them, but how do you put them on and off without um, contaminating yourself um, and and giving yourself coronavirus if the patient had it? Should we be reusing equipment? How do we clean equipment? So all of these challenges we've been dealing with um, and um, to make it safe for people uh, to come in um, and to continue receiving their services. So I think from my point of view in summary, we all know that COVID-19 has had a significant impact upon ENT uh, and laryngology services and, and the accessibility of those services uh, for people with dysphonia. We've, we've had to rapidly adapt um, with telehealth, uh, triage, earlier referral to speech pathology and using protective equipment that we didn't normally need to use. Um, we've been triaging uh, new airway and voice patients uh, to allow assessment of urgency for scoping and there's been increased reliance upon remote monitoring um, and formulating an early management plan in case things don't go so well. 